and welcome to this special edition preparing for Hajj. I have with me Sheikh Yusuf Estes and the first time that we ever met was actually when, when we were performing Hajj. Well yeah but we met on the telephone we, and, but actually seeing each other was I was uh, surprised I was in Hajj we we're going to do that TV thing from mm -hmm. uh, out in Mina and uh, yeah, I saw you over there, and I said, so now I know what the lady looks like because of the voice. Well, that was my first ever hatch, and it was um, an amazing experience for me. How many had you been on? Uh, now, I think... Uh, well, this one coming up, I think, makes six for us. Mm -hmm. Shall I? We'll be doing Hajj, and any of you out there would like to join us. We, we hope you'll do that. Come and be with us for Hajj, and uh, we should be pretty easy to find. We'll, I'll be wearing two towels, and uh, but never mind that. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, it is quite daunting. I, I must admit, when I was given the opportunity uh, to go with the Islam Channel, I barely had time to prepare. And in some ways that was great because I just went straight out. But for many new Muslims, in fact for many Muslims, you know, when it's a first time experience and they're building up and preparing, what advice would you give to a Muslim who is about to go out to perform Hajj for the first time? The best advice for is the advice that was given to me by Yusuf Kavachi, the Imam of the uh, Masjid in, in Dallas, Texas, where I, I went to get my advice from him. By the way, his daughter's Marwa Kavaji, the one from the Turkish who had to get out of town because she wore, oh, she was wow. elected to the parliament. Uh -huh. You remember? That's his daughter. Uh -huh. And they, because she wore the hijab in the parliament, they kicked her out. So, anyhow, another subject. But anyway, he gave my wife and I very good advice, and uh, he said, that whatever you do, you take everything easy, step at a time. Be sure you get hooked up with a good group that knows what's going on. You need to have somebody help you with that. But uh, one thing he told us, don't rent your hotel room over the phone. Why is that? Because it won't be there when you get there. <laughs> but now they've changed all that. It's much uh -huh. easier now. It's required by the Saudi government that you go through somebody that's registered. Mm -hmm. Because so many of the people would, would find that they had no place to stay when they got there. You, you mm -hmm. wouldn't find the person you were looking for, your reservation is gone. Well, I think those know. safeguards are pretty much in, in place in every country now. And of course, they need a Hajj visa, so you can only get your Hajj visa through an accredited well, agent. Well, uh, they have to be approved agent. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that makes a difference, since 1993, when I first made Hajj, the first time, uh, that the, the government of Saudi Arabia has improved a lot of the conditions over there. Mm -hmm. They have taken the initiative to uh, really research and find out what will work and what we can do to make things without lessening the real Hajj or taking away from what Hajj is requiring, but at the same time making it so that they can facilitate the ease of the pilgrims when they go. It is amazing when you imagine, you know, all those millions of uh, brothers and sisters converging into one area. Well, do you know that usually it's anywhere from two and a half to three million all the way up to five or even six million estimate on, on some occasions to have all these people, you know, trying to do the same thing at the same time. Now, here's a city that's uh, built maybe to handle uh, 50 to 100,000 people during the rest of the year. But all of a sudden you've got an influx of these millions, as you said. And now imagine that when they go out to Mina and stay at the campgrounds out there, you know, and then come back and do their tawaf and say, and then take off and everybody goes for Arafat. Now, Arafat, everybody at exactly the same time is in exactly the same place. And it is a big deal. But you're racing ahead of me now because what I really want to do with this program is to take the, the fear out of the, the whole exercise or the, the whole pilgrimage because it is very daunting, especially for new Muslims. And, you know, Islam is the fastest growing faith in the world today. 
So there's lots of new Muslims coming in every year. They want to perform Hajj. And as I discovered, I mean, it's, you have to be fit to, uh, to perform that, it. Right? Well, th actually, that's one of the excuses that, that somebody can give not to do Hajj, is if they're, not, if they're not well. If you're not physically able to do so, if a person is ill, if they're not uh, physically capable of performing Hajj, they're excused until they can. Or if they're never able to, then they can, uh, you know, they, they don't have to do it. But we should try, you know, mm -hmm. of course, if you can. And when Allah makes a way for you and it's safe, then it's an incumbent and requirement of mm -hmm. all the mature Muslims to mm -hmm. once in a life do the Hajj. Now, we also have a lot of non-Muslims who watch the channel because they're wanting to learn more about uh, this great faith. Obviously, they'll come across pilgrims dressed in what appears to be two towels, ready to, you know, which can be quite a strange sight if you're in Heathrow Airport in, in London, for instance. <laughs> and you can see non-Muslims looking, thinking, what is that all about? How would you explain it to them? Now, first of all, you're absolutely right. And, and it's a good Tao. It's a good way for us to bring up the subject with people. And they see that and say, what the heck is going on here? For the women, of course, they wear their regular clothes. Mm -hmm. But for the men, they have to remove all their garments, everything, everything, every, you know, everything, everything. Except they can wear these two garments, which are similar to huge bath towels or beach towels, but nothing sewn on them. And these, one wrapped around the bottom part, and then the other you can kind of like throw it over to your taste, whatever you like, over the shoulders, etc. For the men, even he can't wear his regular shoes. So what you, can you, know, you just like thong sandals, something like that. Mm -hmm. You can wear something like this, but uh, your regular shoes and socks. You can't wear socks. You can't wear a hat. Can't wear a kufi. You can't like I got this on. All that's got to go. So you've just got the the two white pieces of material that's it. <laughs> and a pair of flip flops. <laughs> if you're lucky. But what is the purpose? Why dress right down to you know like this? There's a lot of things in Islam that we can guess what the purpose is. Mm -hmm. But the first and foremost purpose behind everything is, is the order from Allah. And that in itself is a purpose. Allah orders Salah and you do it. Allah orders Zakah and you do it. Allah orders Hajj and you do it. If you say, well, why? What's the benefit, for instance, mm -hmm. Salam Ramadan? Why should I fast Ramadan? Well, you could say, well, I could lose weight. Well, that would be a point. <laughs> Although I never did. <laughs> and you could also say that it, the body needs to be cleansed. And this is certainly a, a fact. But the real reason behind everything is Allah said to do it. So mm -hmm. that's where you do it. Now, what is it related to? Let us use that as a, more of a topic for this. It's related to the ceremonies and rituals that were done by Abraham and his son Ismail thousands of years ago. And they actually built this edifice up on a, a uh, foundation that's been there since the time of Adam, by the way. And this edifice, which we call the Beit Allah, the House of Allah, it represents the place where we go to perform this. And you start right there by going around this seven times. That's the big black cube that yeah. people see. Well, we see. call it that, but mm -hmm. originally it wasn't, it wasn't a cube. Mm -hmm. Originally it had an extended side. It came out, kind of rounded out, you know. And, um, but over the years, that, for whatever reason, was never rebuilt all the way. And the Prophet Sallallahu even commented about it. And there's something to the effect that um, he, he didn't want to change it, to leave it as it was thing though that that cube or square box in the desert and I think it's real key for our new Muslims and non-Muslims to realize that we do not worship the box mm -hmm. we do not worship anything in the box some people said okay Muslims are worshiping black box in the desert I know I used to be one of those people who said that alhamdulillah Allah guided me to Islam <laughs> but that we do not worship anything in it either. And if anybody well, doubts the that, they can, there's nothing. It's empty. There's nothing in the box. No, no. Used to be, used to be before Islam, mm -hmm. that the descendants of Ishmael 
got away from the original religion, they began to worship idols and statues and sun gods and moon gods and so on. In fact, there's uh, Dr. Robert Moore, he's written a book attacking Islam, saying we worship a moon god called Allah. Well, he's taken the information based on before Islam mm -hmm. and trying to incorporate it, make it look like that's what we do today. We do not worship anything in the box. We don't worship the box. We don't worship anything on the planet. In fact, we only worship Allah, and Allah is uh, the object of worship for us, and He's the one who told us to do the, the rituals according to the way of Abraham. That's what we do. So if we go back to the, the airport, wherever it is in the world. Okay. Some brothers don't put on the two white pieces of cloth. They wait until they get on the plane. Mm -hmm. And on my flight, an announcement was made, and the men disappeared and then emerged, changed in, into the, the white cloths. What was that about? Yeah, there's a marker. Uh, th these markers are established to be so far away from the Kaaba or the, uh, the Haram area where the pilgrimage is done. And when you reach that marker, it's too late. You cannot put it on then. You have to go back outside of the marker. Then you put on the Ihram, from the word haram, by the way, mm -hmm. and when you're in ihram or, or you got the garments on, there's uh, everything becomes suddenly forbidden, and that's why it's called haram. You you can't anymore uh, mm -hmm. do certain things. So during the time of it's the... a state of mind along with the clothes, by the way. Right. So during the time of the the prophet peace be upon him, when the pilgrims used to come from hundreds of miles away. Mm -hmm on foot, on, on camels, on horse, they would reach a point where they would then change from being travelers into pilgrims. Yeah. It, it, when you reach the Makat or the, the marker area, then you'd get off your horse or whatever and, and, and in the airplane you can just go in the bathroom somewhere. And so that's when they make an announcement on the plane that we're approaching Yeah, they're approaching telling you it's coming up uh -huh. and then the guys go in there and, and the women don't have to do it. Isn't that nice? Why, why do women not have to do it? Again, it's Allah's choice, but He knows women. We got women off so it it. Yeah, well, <laughs> You know, so many of the things that Allah has made easy for women, if we digress for a moment. Uh, I heard women, uh, people talking, they're not Muslim, they're saying, why Islam doesn't give equal rights to women? And you say, really, you want it to be equal? And even some Muslims, they didn't know very much, they said, yeah, we want everything to be equal in Islam. I said, really? And when you make shahada, what's the first thing after shahada you have to do? They said, pray. I said, how many times a day? They said, five. I said, how many days a week? They said, seven. And I said, how many days out of the year? They said, 365. I said, no, not for women. Because women are excused from the Salah during their monthly time. And mm -hmm. during the monthly time, she has not to worry about the subject. And she doesn't have to keep up with it and make up for it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, well, okay. And then I asked women, would you like to cancel that? And they go, no. And the same is true of fasting. During the fasting time, they don't fast uh, during that time of the month. And here is something in Hajj also. Women don't have to have these uh, two towels. But they're still in a state of ihram. You mm -hmm. still need to make the niya or intention before you reach that point. You know, you need to be sure that you've made this intent. That I, because as the Prophet Sallallahu said, inama amal bin niyat, that all of the amal or actions are going to be rewarded according to what was the intention that went with it. And this intention for Hajj needs to not only be in your mind, but it's a good idea to mention it. Just mentioned, you know, I'm going to be doing Hajj uh, Atamatu, for instance, which means the Hajj of Pleasure. This one is, uh, we're going to kind of get into something here now, is when you have the Hajj where you're going to do Umrah, you're going to come out of Ihram, and then you're going to go back into Ihram later when it's time for your Hajj, and you're going to have Hajj and Umrah together, but with a separation time in between for pleasure. That's what it's called that. Now, in the other case, you might say, I just want to do Hajj only. So you'd put it on and you'd stay in it until Hajj is over and then you come out of it. The third option is something a person can do is do Hajj and Omer together, where they'll do Omer, Hajj, and then finish. But in this one, they don't take off the Ihram in between. How would you explain Umrah? Omer. Omer is also called the lesser Hajj or lesser pilgrimage. But it's real simple to do. In fact, I've done it a couple of times when I didn't go for Hajj. Two other times I visited Saudi and did it. 
And uh, it's really neat if you're used to Hajj, you come in and you do Omer, it's, this is easy, you know. Because basically, again, you will have your uh, two towels on or your uh, Ihram. You come in, you've made your intentions on, you get into the airport, you go through the process and everything, go on out to Mecca. Go straight to Mecca, go straight to the Kaaba, and then you do your uh, seven circumambulations around the Kaaba, which uh, is called Tawaf in Arabic. And when you finish that up, then you uh, you will go over and do the side between Saf and Marwa, mm -hmm. and uh, then, then that's pretty much it. Well, I forgot you got to pray to Raqqa on there over near Ibrahim Station, but that's pretty much it. It's it's not very difficult. It's mm -hmm. the seven circumambulations, then the seven uh, crossings between Saf and Marwa. These are two mountains, by the way, where if you know the story of Hajar or Hagar is in the Bible. When she was left out there by Abraham, uh, she went looking for somebody to help them because they had no food or water. And she ran up one, and then she ran up the other. And each time she would look and didn't find anything, and she prayed each time when she got up there. And that's the prayers that we still do when we do that. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> one of the things that's, that's good for you to think about is, is, believe it or not, is that chapstick for your lips. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't think about that, it's too late. I'm sure you can find it over there, but it's much handier to have your own. And this is so that uh, non-fragrance, you don't have anything with fragrance, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then you can put that on there to keep your lips from chopping. And that's a very good thing to have. Another thing is soap. You might wonder, why would I take soap? Well, we started making soap, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we make it and offer it at the masjid at the time of Hajj so people can have it that has no fragrance, no scent, no smell. Right, so it's important. Non-perfumed soap takes some cream. When I was out in, in Mecca, I noticed a lot of people with face masks. And it was after the SARS scare, and I thought, what's going on here? And some people said, look, there are so many bugs going around and people sneezing and coughing, you'll pick up something. And I just thought, oh, this is ridiculous. But I have to say, I went down with about five different types of bugs by the end of, um, <laughs> end of Hajj. If anybody was going to get it, you would. <laughs> well, and I just thought to myself, you know, why was I laughing at those people wearing the surgical masks and how I wish I'd, uh, you know, what a sensible idea it seemed it wasn't because of SARS, by the way. No, I They know. did it before. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. first time I ever went, they had it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. But people in Indonesia and other countries, they wear it a lot anyway. Mm -hmm. if, you see, if you ever see the news things and it shows them, they're, well, you've been in these countries. Mm -hmm. You know that a lot of people wear those the mask and mm -hmm. it's, they think nothing of it. It's like a, a surgical mask or a mask mm -hmm. that a scientist would wear for anti-pollution. Or a painter when he's spraying paint. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, have you... Yeah, I, I carry that. Actually, mm -hmm. I carry it with me all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. I never use it, but I have it in my baggage. I don't know why. But uh, if if I ever wanted it, I could have it and cover up my mm -hmm. uh, uh, face mints with you. Now, I know that seems silly to mention. We mm -hmm. would obviously remember. Be surprised how many times people get on that, oh, my passport, oh, my tickets, oh, my visa, oh, you know. And, and then another thing is a document stating from your doctor, a notarized document that has been approved and probably usually sent in to Saudi's embassy to start with, that uh, says that you've had certain shots. Because mm -hmm. if you're not cleared to go and health-wise, you get rejected for visa anyway. So you have to have all of that, though. And don't think, oh, well, I've already done that and this. I'll just take my passport and go. And you need to have the documentation, mm -hmm. proper documentation, whatever that means to you. Have your documentation and have it handy. One of the things I recommend is... Um, reach over and grab something. It's not a prop. This is real, by the way. <laughs> this is, you get a plastic bag, you know, with a zip thing on there, and put your stuff in the bag and zip. And that's a real good idea for any of your uh, documents or something that you don't want to get wet or moist or something like that because you're not going to be able to, for the man, that is, he's, not, he's got nowhere to, I no pockets. I was going to say, where, where do you, you don't, you don't have a valise or a little wallet or anything to... I recommend take a wife with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's always a good idea because my wife carries everything, <laughs> but seriously, and uh, obviously that's not always practical, but, uh, yeah, and if you had a whole lot of stuff, I guess, well, look, Islam will allow you to have more wives if you had a whole lot of stuff, but uh, that's another subject. I'm not going to bite. I am not going to, uh, to bite on that. Now then, 
The belt, buddy belt, buddy belt. <laughs> Come back to the subject. They can wear a money belt, uh, what they call our document belt, that you can put underneath your towels and That's stuff. That's permissible. Yeah. Yeah, they have a rule on that. There's certain things about the money belt. You should try to get one that's uh, that's made by Muslim or Muslim country or something mm -hmm. where they know what the rules are about it mm -hmm. so that it's made properly. And uh, they're riveted together, I think, instead of sewn. And sometimes mm -hmm. they make exceptions. I don't know. But look into that with your local imam, what he tells you. Rather, different matahab have different little bit fine-tuning on some of the rulings. I, I recommend talk to your local imam on that. Mm -hmm. But now, that's, you got to have something to put your documents in. Mm -hmm. Because obviously your wife can't be with you all the time. So you do have to have your, and that's what I was talking about, put your uh, passport and stuff in a, in a uh, Ziploc, then mm -hmm. put it in the money bag or whatever. By the way, we're on the subject of money bag. <clears throat> be careful, because not everybody there is for hajj. Be careful, because not everybody there is for the pleasure well, of Allah. Why else would you go to Mecca? Rip people off. No. Yep. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I was there, I was warned, okay? So if you warn me ahead of time, I'm usually smart enough to figure it out. If you don't warn me, then I'm just mm -hmm. like any other naive person. But I was warned, and not once, many times, be careful, be careful, be careful. There are people there who will rip you off. They'll come up to you with these stories. Oh, I need this, I need that. And sure enough, we saw it. A guy came up and he had this paper and he's telling us, my daughter's in the hospital and she needs an operation and we need so much money. And say, oh, well, I'll go down to the thing and talk to them. No, 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 it has to be money. I'm just get some cash, get some cash, help me. Now look at the document he has, and it's saying Dr. So-and-so has approved an operation as soon as he raises 16,000 reals, he can blah, blah, blah. And the brother that lives there, he said, uh, excuse me, Sheikh, did you know that the hospitals here are free for the Hajis? I said, what? He said, yeah, there's no way this guy's telling you the truth. It's very <laughs> difficult, though, isn't it? You, you're going out there, you're, you know... Um, on a, a mission, on a pilgrimage, you're feeling spiritual and, and you're to wanting to have yeah. all the good qualities um, of uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and, and somebody in need presents himself in front of you. And you're supposed to do it in Hajj. You're supposed to give charity, so Your you want to do it. Your desire is yeah. to help. Now, it looks like, by the way, you would get a reward if you didn't know you'd give reward. You'd get a uh, benefit back. Prophet Sassam talked about that. Listen to this one. This is a hadith of Prophet Sassam. And he was saying that uh, somebody wanted to give charity. So he gave charity. And the next day it was said that somebody gave charity uh, to a thief. Oh, but he still gave charity again the next day. And then it was said somebody gave charity to a prostitute. And he said, oh. And then and he still gave charity. And then it was said the next day that, oh, somebody gave charity to a rich man. And he was trying to give his charity in, in you know, secrecy, etc. And so, but this was coming out to him, and he was understanding that it happened. But now look what the Prophet Sassam explained. That the one who was the thief, when he got the charity, he realized, I don't need to steal. Everything comes from Allah. So he stopped stealing. The prostitute realized essentially the same thing. I don't need to do this. So she stopped her business and became a good lady. And so that charity helped her. But what about the rich man? The rich man. That's the best one. He realized that, hey, you know what? I need to be a lot more generous and stop being so stingy because everything comes from Allah. So in each case, it increased the person's correct belief. So you, when you give your charity, you give from your heart and don't worry about what the other people are going to do with it. Do be careful with that, but at the same time, respect those who are there who are trying to make a living. You might think, well, why don't they do it for Allah? Well, you could do a lot of stuff for Allah and never charge anything, just work all the rest of your life. You, you wouldn't live very long, you know. And some of them charge to push the wheelchairs, mm -hmm. if you need a wheelchair to, to go around. And some of them will charge to take you someplace. Some will charge you for food. And you, these are normal things. As you get closer to the Hajj time, the price of wheelchairs is going to go up. And if you need to use that to get around there, then you expect to pay more, you know. But mm -hmm. that's uh, normal. That's how business works. Now, what about any physical or mental preparations? First of all, before you make the Hajj, as we already said, you need to make the intention for it. Making the intention for Hajj is a part of it. Without the intention, you don't have Hajj. And then what should I think about? One of the things that I always like to emphasize to myself and to the students is the same, that we should always wear a garment 
all the time, whether in Hajj or not. And that garment is called taqwa, to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, respect for Him, and be righteous in what we do. So we should be thinking about that and thinking about that what I'm doing now is to please my Lord first and foremost. I'm not doing it for my wife. I'm not doing it for my friends. I'm not doing it to show off. I want to do it for Allah. I want Him to accept it. So that's what I would put as number one. As far as the rest of it, it's going to be the sequence of events. That's usually the problem most of us have. What do I do first? Mm -hmm. It's not just how to do it and so on, but what, what's first? What's the first thing I do? Well, the first thing you do when you check in, as you go through the process of getting into the country with a visa, is to find your group, because now you can't travel without a group. You've got to have a group. Get with your group and then follow your emir or the mutawa, whoever is the one that's appointed there by the government for you, uh, to, that's going to be with your group. And that person will begin to explain things to you. Now, if you speak English, you should be with a group that's an English group. They have it in English. The booklets and pamphlets, whatever they've got, are provided by the government. They're right there for you. It's in your language. And they have plenty of them. They have stacks of them. Now, if you speak Urdu, they have it in Urdu. If you speak Thai, they have it in Thai. Whatever language, mm -hmm. go with those people and stay with them and be sure you uh, get proper instruction. I know a lot of times that you want to run and see some friends, maybe you know from different places, and go visit and run around and do things. But try to remember that's not why you're there. It's not a social event, although there's nothing wrong with socializing. There's nothing wrong with seeing your friends, hanging out, doing some things. But that's not your primary target. primary target is to see about how close you can come to worshiping Allah on His terms. Because what happens is, in the Hajj, if you're successful, and this is what we should maybe have mentioned in the mm -hmm. beginning, but we've been well, jumping no all over. If, that. If, mm -hmm. if you're successful in the Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ promises you Jannah. Successful Hajj, Mabrur, is nothing less than Jannah. That's the process I'm saying. How do you know? Jannah is seen... paradise. By the way, I forgot to mention, for those who don't know uh -huh. Arabic, that is the, the paradise. Uh -huh. But how do you know if you've been successful? You know, that's the good part about Islam. You never know. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's the exciting part. Because no matter what you do, the show that we're doing right now, well, it's not that we, we hope Allah will accept this, yes? <laughs> uh -huh. I'm doing this for Allah. Uh -huh. That's why I'm here. That's why I come over to UK, the programs that we're doing and so mm -hmm. on. I hope Allah will accept it, but I don't know if He will. You don't know if He will. So this is what keeps us on our toes. Day by day by day, we're saying, Allah, accept this from me. Allah, accept this from me. Allah, keep my intention pure for you and keep me in the right way. We're constantly saying that. That's good. Keep you on your toes. Now then, I remember when I entered the Grand Mosque, my heart was racing as I walked to, to see the first sight of the Kaaba. Is there anything that you should say or do the moment you clap eyes on the Kaaba? A lot of people think there is. I've heard a lot of people say a lot of strange things mm -hmm. about that. But uh, I was traveling with several imams, American imams at the time, and they basically explained that there's a lot of things people do, not necessarily based on Islam, but cultural things that they picked up over centuries and so on. You want to be careful of that. But I do remember this, just as you mentioned, that first time of seeing the Kaaba is something that is so breathtaking. Now, I was talking with my friends. We're walking along, and I'm joking around with them. and. Uh, mm -hmm. As I glance through these pillars, there's so many pillars in there, by the way. It mm -hmm. looks like a forest of marble. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. So many of these pillars are in there, you know, and you're looking through them. And all of a sudden, I caught this little black something. And it is ink black, isn't it? It it's, is. It is mm -hmm. black as mm -hmm. ink, you're right. And I turned and I looked. And when I saw it, it was like I couldn't hear my friends anymore. Mm -hmm. And I saw this and I went, oh. I was just staring. And uh, it's something just came over me. This is it. This is the place mm -hmm. that Abraham and his son Ishmael built up. This is the place where Muhammad Sallallahu walked around this very same place. He spoke here. He taught here. And his companions also were here. And it's just, it starts getting overwhelming. You start, I mean, even now I'm getting I know I'm getting all tingly just, uh, just thinking about it. I remember one year I was there. And uh, I was coming from the Kaaba. I had the Kaaba at my back. And by the way, there's some people think you have to back out. You can't put your back to it. That's also wrong. There's mm -hmm. nothing about that. You can put your back to the Kaaba. No problem. I was going out. And as I was going out, a man was coming in, dressed in his ihram. And he got to a certain point, and he was looking down, you know, following where he's going, on the steps and on. And he looked up, and he saw it, and he went, oh, Allah, 
And he started praying right then and there. Mm -hmm. Now, some people think you're supposed to pray while looking at the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. That that's the only place where you don't look down, that you look at the Kaaba. And I researched it. It's not true. Mm -hmm. You look down there just like you do anywhere else. You don't look up at the Kaaba where you do Salat. And the only thing that you look other than where you're going to put your head is when you move your finger in the Salat, you look to that. That's mm -hmm. what they said. That's the evidence for that. So uh, that, that being the case, um, I think when anybody goes to the Kaaba, they should know there isn't any special thing. You don't have to go, Allah, oh, Akbar, or do anything. But when you're doing the Tawaf around the Kaaba, there is a place where the black stone is, and we're going to come to the black stone mm -hmm. now, that in that case, you do raise your right hand up like this, and you can say, Bismillah, Akbar, and keep on going. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about the black stone? I do, but let's have a, a break, and, uh, and we'll come back and talk about the black stone. See you after the break. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to this special Hajj for uh, new Muslims, Muslims who are making their first pilgrimage. And I have with me an old hand, a, a veteran haji. Was there an emphasis on the word old or the word hand? <laughs> of course, it's the irrepressible <laughs> Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Is now, that irresponsible <laughs> or irrepressible? Never mind, go ahead. <laughs> right, we, we've, <laughs> we're inside the Grand, uh, the grand Mosque and... Uh, uh, the amazing sight. We've seen the uh, the Kaaba, and you say that uh, there isn't any special little prayer that you have to say. Not for the Kaaba. Uh huh. Not for the Kaaba. There mm -hmm. isn't. Although I've seen people see it, and like I was saying earlier, that a man saw that and he just, like a reflex, said, "Allah, mm -hmm. where he started doing his salat." Mm -hmm. I won't tell him his salat's not valid. I won't tell him anybody that, but. Yeah, we don't have an evidence that this is uh, prescribed as act of worship, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I want to mention for our viewers, if you just tuned in, we've been talking about the Hajj or pilgrimage in Islam. Allah tells us in the Quran, O oh, you uh, human beings, fear your Lord, be dutiful to Him. Verily, the earthquake of the hour is a terrible thing. The day you shall see it, every nursing mother will forget her nursling, every pregnant one will drop her load. You shall not see mankind as in a, you shall see him in a, a, like he's drunk, yet they won't be drunk, and severe will be the torment. Among mankind is the one who disputes concerning Allah without knowledge and follows every rebellious devil. And you might wonder, what has that got to do with your subject? Well, throughout the entire Hajj or pilgrimage that you're doing, we're supposed to be reflecting on this part of Surtul Hajj. If you know that's uh, in the Quran, uh, Surah 22 is talking about this. It's a reminder of what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. And this is really one of the things that we're preparing ourselves for in this life is for the next life. When we're doing Hajj, we're thinking in terms of how I can get forgiven. That's the big deal. I want to mm -hmm. be forgiven. I want to go to Jannah. I want to be prepared for the Day of Judgment. And it's a horrible day. That day of judgment is going to be really scary. One of the prayers that you offer, I want to jump around a little bit. You're going around, let's do Tawaf. We're mm -hmm. going around the Tawaf, going around the Kaaba. Here we are going around. And as we're doing that, there are prayers that we can say at different parts of it. One of those prayers is, Rabbana, ati nafi dunya hasan, wa fil akirti hasan, wa kina adab and nar. The translation to English more or less says, Our Lord... Give us the good of this life and grant us the good of the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire. And this, Allah says about that, whoever, and this isn't from the Quran, Allah said, whoever says, our Lord give us the good of this life and nothing else, then that's what they're going to get, the good of this life and nothing else. But those who ask for the good of this life and the good of the next life and seek refuge with Allah from the fire, then of course that's what He's going to give them. So that's one of the prayers that's offered constantly as you're doing this uh, Torah. Now, when we left uh, our last segment, we mentioned that we'd come back and talk about Hajar Aswad. What is Hajar Aswad? The black stone. Ah, were you guessing or you knew? 
Well, I, I sort of half-guessed. Half-guessed. Uh -huh. But when I was, I really, really wanted to touch it. I bought some postcards with it on, mm -hmm. and I just thought, I really, really need to touch that. And my... Touch the stone. Yeah. The black and, stone. And my companion said, don't go near it, because the only way you can touch the stone, you will hurt pilgrims as you're doing it, because it's crushed. Uh, everybody is uh, is crushed and pushing, and, and uh, you could, A, endanger yourself, but you could also end up hurting a brother or a sister as you're trying to touch the stone. But it must have some significance, because so many people try and touch it. There is some very, uh, I want to say limited significance related to the stone, Hajiraswa, black stone. But there is a tremendous amount, uh, amount of uh, attention paid to it by people who think that that's the big part of Hajj, just to get to touch the stone. Some feel like if they didn't touch it, they didn't really make Hajj. How many you have no benefit to help me or hurt me. And if I hadn't seen the Prophet Sallallahu do it, then I wouldn't do it. But because he saw the Prophet Sallallahu kiss the stone, he kissed the stone. But there's no mention anywhere that the Prophet Sallallahu said, you have to kiss the stone, or look at me, I'm going to go kiss the stone now. Oh man, that was really nice kissing the stone, it, nice tasting stone. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing like what that. What is the stone? What is its significance? Some stories say that the stone, the black stone, originated in outer space and it came like a, a meteor fell to the earth about the time that adam was created and it was clear like crystal and due to the sins of the people over the many centuries it turned black now, i don't think there's real evidence behind it to prove that but it has been there for a very long time it may well have been there since the time of adam in some form i don't know that mm -hmm. but uh, as far as it changing color and everything i don't know if you could prove that either but uh, a lot of folks don't know it, but that stone's been broken. It's been broken into pieces and put back together. It was stolen at one point, wasn't That's it? That's true, but it was also broken by a catapult. They were, fight, you know, they were fighting uh, with an, the enemy outside the walls of the, the Haram area, and they threw rocks with those catapults, you know, uh -huh. and uh, things. And anyway, it broke the stone, and they... Uh, patched it back together. It it's, doesn't look like it if you get up close to it. I've seen pictures of it real close. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, according to what I read, it's been broken. Another thing you might like to know, I think a more interesting story about the stone is that uh, once upon a time before Islam came, that the tribes of Mecca, the controlling factors of Mecca, uh, were doing like a cleanup and rebuilding and everything for it. Even though they weren't Muslims, even in those days, they worshipped there are false gods in that area, as we spoke about in the earlier program. And, of course, this is what Islam came to destroy, these false gods, idols, statues, uh, senem, as they're called in Arabic. But, um, anyway, while they did it, they removed the stone. Now they were going to put the stone back up where it goes. But it couldn't be decided which tribe was going to have the right to do that, to put the stone back. And it was one of those little things in the beginning, but it escalated up pretty fast about, hey, who's going to get to do this? And each tribe is saying, no, we have the right to put the stone in its final place. And they couldn't resolve it. They couldn't uh, come up with a solution. And they said, okay, let the next person that walks in through the gate there, let him decide where we're going to, uh, you know, which one of us is going to put it out. Mm -hmm. and guess who walked in? The Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the one who walked in. When he walked in, they were happy. And uh -huh. look what they said. Couldn't be a better person for this because he was known to them as the Sadiq. He was the truthful. And that is how they knew him, by this nomenclature. They said, let him decide. And look what he came up with. And they were right. He was the right one to decide. He said, take a sheet, blanket, or some cloth like this, okay, and then put the stone on that. Okay, then each one of the member of the tribe, one of the members of the tribe, grab a hold and hold on to this uh, thing, and all of you pull it up there and put it up to its place, and then I'll push it in there for you. And they all said, well, that's perfect, and that's what they did. They all lifted it up on the sheet, and then he pushed it in, and they went on about their business. It does show you how men can be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit nearsighted from time to time. So
They'll touch different parts of the masjid. They'll touch different emblems that are around there, thinking that it will bring them some good luck or something. And what about <coughs> these footprints? The, yeah, the first time I saw them, immediately when I saw them, I wondered, what is that really? Mm -hmm. Because the stories that we have about Ibrahim alayhi salam is he was very tall. In fact, mm -hmm. he was tall, really tall, to the extent that he, he did stand on a stone or something around there to put those final blocks in place. If you know how big that is, mm -hmm. he'd have been huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that's true, and this is the place of that stone, then those aren't his footprints. Because mm -hmm. they're not even as big as my feet. But what is the point of having it there in, in that glass It shows you where the stone was, uh -huh. and, I, and it, that, that he actually, that may be the stone that's in there too. Mm -hmm. But as far as the footprints themselves, I doubt it, but I'm not going to argue with people. I mean, if they mm -hmm. think it is, okay, alhamdulillah. But it, you certainly don't pray to it or touch it as... The only marker for that mm -hmm. is that w that is mentioned, it's in the Hadith of the Prophet Islam, he talks about it, that once you've done your seven circumambulations or tawaf, then it's necessary for you to pray two rakah, and you pray those two rakah, rakatain, right after that area. You pass it, and right in there is where you can mm -hmm. do these two rakah. But because it's so crowded all the time, the, the scholars have made it very clear that is not necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. Especially if people can get hurt, then pray further back. And they're showing everybody, pray back over there, pray back mm -hmm. over there. And I, and I did, when I was first Muslim, did the first hajj, I did try to pray there, and boy, mm -hmm. I got stampeded. Mm -hmm. I really got stampeded. And I see people there all the time fighting, trying to make it so that they're like their wife is trying to do the thing, and he's standing there like this, and a couple other guys, and they're pushing, let her pray. And they're, yeah, but this is uh, very counterproductive. You're there to worship Allah and, and not hurt people. So. But Don't I suppose, you know, Hajj for many people is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That's Although true. some people go regularly, that's true. but for some people, and so they really need to get it right. Because as you said before, the stakes are high. True. And one of the things is that, uh, you know, it's the fifth pillar of Islam. That means that you have to do it to be a Muslim. You have mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Unless there is some circumstances that would uh, make it such that you wouldn't have to do it. Uh, the case of a man who physically can't do it, a woman who doesn't have a man to go with her mm -hmm. can't do it, uh, okay. But in the case where you're healthy, able to, you know, financially able to, etc., then it's your requirement. It's not an option to you. If that hodge comes and goes and you don't make it, and you say, well, I'll get it next year when i got more money, I'm saving up to buy a new car. No, you can't do that because you don't know that you'll live another year. Mm -hmm. So you would be deficient on the Day of Judgment. You would not have one of the pillars that's necessary to be considered as Muslim. Now, if you can't go, what, I mean, what happens if you're in prison? Say the Guantanamo, oh, like lay I, boys. Well, like I said, if you can go. But obviously any of those things, if mm -hmm. somebody's incarcerated, mm -hmm. uh, or even if they're... Uh, uh, can uh, someone go on Even if behalf? somebody's a slave. Well, somebody could be a slave. That, mm -hmm. that happened to Muslims. They were slaves and couldn't go. Uh, if you were uh, in uh, the military mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let you go, if you were in a country that won't give you a visa or allow you to leave, or you can, uh, maybe mm -hmm. Saudi won't give you a visa for whatever reason, mm -hmm. maybe your country, whatever. So in those cases, Allah is excusing you because he's the one who controls everything and you don't have to go until Allah makes a way. That's part of the condition. It says mm -hmm. when you're able and Allah makes a way. But... Aren't there exceptions when I or you or any of us could go and perform Hajj on behalf of somebody else who can't go? Only if they've passed away. Mm -hmm. Not if they're ill or incapacitated or... Well, they might get well. Mm -hmm. In the case where there's somebody just, you know they can never go, mm -hmm. ever, and you have already done your Hajj, this is one of the conditions, mm -hmm. your Hajj has to already be completed. Because this happened to me. My dad came to Islam and uh, he was elderly and not able to do a lot. He was actually taking us to the airport for our first Hajj in 93. And he said to me something about this subject. How about me doing Hajj? And I said, well, Dad, I don't know. But I've heard that you can do Hajj for somebody that's not able to do it. And I'll check it out. And when I got back, he asked me. And I told him, Dad, I can't do it for you on this time because 
I had to do my own. Mm -hmm. But let me check again and see what's this. And uh, my father passed away, and when he passed away, I said to Allah that I, the next chance I got, I would do Hajj, mm -hmm. and I would do it for him. And uh, I guess that's how it was. And SubhanAllah, I got to do the very next Hajj, came up, and it was so amazing, because as hard as the first one was, this one was as easy. Mm -hmm. It was just like Allah made it easy, because he knew I was doing it for mm -hmm. my dad anyway. And mm -hmm. it was so sweet and soft, and I, I had fun. Mm -hmm. The first time I wasn't fun. How because can you have fun on Hajj? Uh, just was fun. I got to go and see people that I knew from before, mm -hmm. and the, I visited places that I knew what was coming up, and it was just really easy. Mm -hmm. and by the way, I recommend to folks to get a video about this Hajj mm -hmm. and watch it. It's in English and it's free. Mm -hmm. And guess whose website you can get it from? Well, give me a clue. Ours. <laughs> if you so, go to mm -hmm. shareislam.com, mm -hmm. shareislam, S-H-A-R-E-I-S-L-A-M.com, then go down the page. It shows you a lot of websites. And one of the websites that you're looking for here is called watchislam.com. Mm -hmm. But if you can remember a lot of names, you can also do that. Just remember watchislam.com. Go there. Click on the links until you can list all the videos. Then drop down that menu and click all, list all. Then go to the bottom of that page. You're going to find a video there. Mm -hmm. Now, I talked about earlier about finding the one on Salat. Mm -hmm. There's one for Salat, but there's also one there for this uh, Hajj. Mm -hmm. And it's from the Ministry of Hajj in Saudi Arabia, and it's in English. Right. One of the issues that I wanted to talk to you about was um, the issues of uh, segregation. Because a lot of people believe in segregation and segregation is in evidence in most mosques and the first thing that hits you when you get to Mecca is men and women are praying alongside each other, they're in the company of each other doing the tawaf, it's a total cocktail of, of, um, of human life w you know, what's the deal? Okay, first of all when you start talking about segregation, I was imagining what I grew up with with the word. Segregation that I grew up with in the United States, especially in the South, was black and white. Mm -hmm. So Islam totally and completely forbids that kind of segregation. No, I'm talking Mars I know, and Venus. I know, but I'm, you made me think, you see. So I'm uh -huh. thinking, aha, uh -huh. Islam uh, forbids one kind and orders another kind. The mm -hmm. opposite of this society. Where everywhere we find in the Western society there's there's a prejudice toward ethnicity, mm -hmm. a prejudice toward race, a prejudice toward color. And uh, if anybody denies that, uh, be careful, they probably deny other things too, you know. Mm -hmm. The reality is there. Even today, even with so-called freedoms and so on, you still have this ethnicity or, or uh, racial segregation. Even in uh, places of worship and things like that, you just, let's go with our own kind kind of a thing. And I want to make sure that you understand that Islam gets rid of that. And this is the place where you will go and find there is no segregation by race or color or uh, ethnicity. You go, you see black, brown, yellow, no green. Uh, <laughs> you see all colors are there, everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is what impressed Malcolm X, by the way, to really mm -hmm. become a Muslim when he saw that. And he just back Well, he ended up praying next to some blonde, blue-eyed yeah. man. And, and, and he said, I'd always been brother. taught these guys are mm -hmm. a bunch of, you know, devils. Mm -hmm. And he said, this guy's right next to me and he's just mm -hmm. the same as me. And everybody's the same. That's one of the beautiful parts about this is the Ihram state of having those two towels. Everybody's the same. It's no different. Well, anyhow, coming back to this. It is the only place on earth where the men and the women pray standing next to each other mm. because the Prophet ﷺ made it clear that that was the only place for us to do that. Now we've had some recent years who said that, well it looks like we should be able to do that anywhere because it was done then. But that has always been the exception and they're trying to use the exception to be the rule and pretend like they've discovered something brand new and in fact they haven't done anything except cause a problem for themselves. But the basic thing here is to understand that when you're traveling like that and you've come so far and if you split a woman from her protection, which is her mahram, and she has no other place, what would happen? 
And that was, you know, before cell phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. What would happen to this lady? And she has all these people going around. Anything could happen. Mm -hmm. So it means that even in the salah, you can be next to each other. However, pay attention to this. If Friday comes up while you're there in this uh, sanctuary, which is the haram, and it's time for the Juma Salah, the regular Juma Salah, which is performed there. People of Mecca, they, whether they're in Hajj or not, they've got to come too and perform their Juma. And in that case, they do divide the women from the men over there. And the Juma is performed totally separate, just like it is anywhere else on earth any other Friday. And I've, I've seen some... Um, I know this is something you can help me with, because I have seen some women... Um, wearing a full face veil, um, a black abaya, and they are directing the women into areas and mm -hmm. almost, um, I don't know if they are Saudi police women or just um, officials within the mosque to make sure that the women go into certain areas. And I saw them, and they're very distinctive in their, their black abayas, and I, I saw them and I thought, I didn't think you could wear a niqab or a full face veil in the harem. Most likely it would never work there. Mm -hmm. That's a very hard job. It's very rough. Most of the mm -hmm. people that are there are uh, expatriates, okay, just so you know that. Uh, if you notice, they also wore black gloves. Yeah, totally covered. Yeah, yeah totally covered. Mm -hmm. But they're not in Hajj. They live there. They work there. So it wouldn't be relative, even if what you said is true, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be relative to them. They work there. Right. Well, let's <laughs> clear that one up. Yeah. But there's a little bit more to go along with that. That these women who are working there doing this, they're trying to facilitate several things at the same time. And one of them is the security. You know, they're watching. But there are women there so that if there are women who are coming through, that it's a woman dealing with a woman instead of a man coming up and telling mm -hmm. her, oh, they said that are touching her or something mm -hmm. like that. So this is one of the reasons the women are there, and this is what part of their job is. Uh, another thing, though, it, you might be surprised to know that any woman who comes there, even if she normally wears a face veil, it's the one place on earth that there is, in time of the year, that there's no question about whether or not somebody can have a face cover. And it's not because of the sanctuary, it's the event, the Hajj. Mm -hmm. It's throughout the Hajj, not just there at the sanctuary. A woman cannot wear her face, a face veil during that time. Are you sure about woman that? I hate to question you. Cannot you just, no. wear mm -hmm. the face veil during that time. Now wait. So no niqab, yeah. no yeah. veil. Wait a second. Just as in everything in Islam, watch for the exceptions to the rule. Uh -huh. Exceptions. This is on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha. Now, remember, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ did cover their faces. For mm -hmm. them, it was far. Now, all the rest of the women on the earth, if they want to wear the face cover, and they do wear it in many places, this is extra points, okay? They mm -hmm. get more reward with the law, and it's certainly a lot safer for them, maybe in some cases, but it is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. But for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, it was mandatory. And Aisha radiallahu anh says that even for her, like all the women, they had to remove the face cover, except if a man was too close to them. Any man got close, a writer would come by, they would pull their face cover back down. It's in the hadith, read it. And then when they would leave, they'd raise it back up again. Mm -hmm. Because during the Hajj, all women must remove their face cover. This proves something else, too. It proves that face cover is a part of Islam if a lady would like it. Because but, otherwise, if you wouldn't say, and there wouldn't be a rule that you have to remove something that's not there. But it would be impossible to remove your face veil because the, the men are everywhere. This is why you find most of the women today who wear the face veil, they keep it on. My wife keeps it on. Mm -hmm. Because at that stage, at mm -hmm. that stage, the men are too close. But you have to remember, there was a time when there weren't millions of people doing Hajj. Mm -hmm. And there weren't millions of men all over the place. And it was easy for a lady to lift her face veil up and so on. But remember, again, it's not mandatory for a woman to wear a face veil. Mm -hmm. Only for the wives of the Prophet. And this is the, not my ruling. I'm not making this up. This is the ruling of the majority of all the scholars. There are some who do believe, 
according to their culture more so, I guess, than anything, or their upbringing, the, the evidences they have, instead of making it something which is, uh, uh, it's called sunnah muakada, which is highly stressed. That's the most you should say about it. But not that it's wajib or fard, because if you said that, you have to have a clear proof. And the clearest proof that we can get for it would be from the Quran. And there's nothing in the Quran that says cover the face. Mm -hmm. What it says in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, this is usually the verse people go to, verse 31, it says for them, the women, to lower their gaze, guard their private parts, and then it tells them to lower something else. Lower their khimar. You're wearing something almost like khimar now, that purple thing on top of your regular hijab. is similar like they used to have something hanging down the back, I thought, of a ponytail area. And then they would drop it down over the front, over juyu behinna. That's what it said in the Quran. Juyu behinna actually refers to this area right in here, covering your chest area. So this is why they flopped it down like this. And it would have covered your face if you did exactly what it says. But there isn't anything that says you couldn't open it up to be able to see. Okay? Now, Aisha Radiallahuana makes a dua for a prayer, a supplication, for the women who, when they heard this, that they tore their uh, aprons, they were wearing an apron over their skirt, they tore this thing and put it up over their heads and covered their faces. Cover their heads and their faces. This is what it says in Hadith. This is in Sahih Bukhari, volume 6, uh, chapter 280, uh, no, 202, Hadith number 282. That's where you'll find that one. And it's very clear that she was making dua because they did it, but she didn't say all the women had to do it. Why did the uh, wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, have to cover up and the other women didn't? Well, all the women have to cover in Islam, yes, mm -hmm. but to what extent? Because his wives stayed behind veils, uh, even curtains and things. Even Aisha, when she taught, when she taught Islam, she was behind a curtain in her house all the time. And But this is because they were his wives. And uh, this is his right. Allah is giving him this, that other people don't get to eyeball his wives. Mm -hmm. That's not right. And uh, they're going to be with him in paradise. And uh, uh, all of them, by the way, they were happy with this too. None of them, yeah, they had the right, according to the Quran itself. If you don't want to do it, you can break and run. If you don't want to be married to him anymore, go ahead and go. Mm -hmm. But none of them opted for that, to seek the fun of this world. They wanted to have the pleasures of the next world. But in any case, to come back to the face covering in Hajj, it is a requirement not to cover your face, except if a man can get too close to you, and that means you would ordinarily cover your face. Mm -hmm. In your case, you, do, you don't ever wear it. Do you? Have you ever worn it? No? Okay. Well, then it wouldn't be of any concern to you because mm -hmm. you shouldn't put it on for that because it's told you not to do it anyway. No, but it, it's still of interest because I was told um, that women who wear niqab don't have to wear it when they perform hajj, and yet I saw some women wearing uh, a, f a face veil or the niqab and I'm thinking well this is opposite to what I've been taught and it's very very confusing as a new Muslim to yeah. work out well what is right and what is wrong and, and this know, is what it is the ladies mm -hmm. feel like that uh, these men are too close to me and I want to mm -hmm. continue to cover my face and so I do you mentioned something uh, before, um, prayer, du'a, and I really want to discuss that as well because um, this, these aren't ordinary prayers in, in Mecca or, well, we haven't even got to Medina, but we're going to take a break. Please do stay with us and uh, we'll see you shortly. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> 